Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and it's time for part five of my series on the selected gross pathology of the rabbit, in which we're going to talk about the integumentary system. Before we start, I want to thank my friends and colleagues, many listed here, who have provided me their images to put these lectures together over the years, either directly or through online collections. Let's start with a disease that primarily affects wild rabbits, both Silvilagus and Erectilagus, and affects animals in the United States, Europe, and Australia. This is a disease called myxomatosis. It's not just a skin disease, but the skin lesions are very striking. This is a systemic disease caused by a lepery pox virus, lepori meaning rabbit, and a pox virus which is indistinguishable from vaccinia virus and causes different three distinct diseases. It likes to jump species, so it will affect both Silvilagus or Rictilagus, and actually will cause lesions in squirrels as well. When myxomatosis hits a susceptible population, it wipes out almost all of them except for a resistant few, and then will disappear for about 10 years until the population of susceptible rabbits builds back up. In this particular animal, you can see that there is tremendous edema, or at least swelling, of the eyelids. The name myxomatosis comes from the myxedema that is associated with it, a tremendous amount of ground substance, and it causes a proliferation of fibroblasts. Laboratory rabbits may be infected with, uh, with the particular agent, and we see the same uh, swelling around the eyelids, swelling of the head, and the ears themselves are in a down position because of the tremendous weight of the myxedema that is present throughout the animal's body. This is a disease that kills fairly quickly. Uh, within six to eight days, you'll get full-blown disease. Uh, following uh, inoculation by a flea or tick, which generally spread the virus, a small subcutaneous mass will show up at the inocul inoculation site within three to four days. Um, then you get full-blown disease, which includes mucopurulent conjunctivitis, uh, large numbers of areas with myxedema in the skin, um, and affects within the lungs and other organs. The animals are also very uh, immune suppressed as well. They're rarely a percute deaths where the animals just drop over, um, with the only sign being sort of a mild conjunctivitis. But usually you will see the very characteristic signs of swelling throughout the subcutaneous tissue. And this is a wild rabbit and somebody has incised the ear. And you can see the tremendous amount of mix edema within the tissue. You'll see changes in a number of organs including type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia, you'll see uh, lymphoid depletion within lymph nodes and the spleen, and generally the high mortality rates are the result of a combined multi-organ dysfunction and secondary bacterial infections as a result of viral immunosuppression. The skin lesion is very characteristic, and this is a cut through the ear once again, and you can see just the tremendous amount of edema in this tissue. And if you look at higher magnification, you will see a proliferation of these atypical fibroblasts, which often have uh, eosinophilic inclusions. These are known as myxoma cells and are extremely characteristic. The overlying epidermis may be somewhat hyperplastic, but as opposed to the lesion I'm going to talk about in a minute, does not have the characteristic uh, pox viral inclusions. They are restricted to these proliferating fibrocytes within the dermis. A second type of, uh, of lesion that is associated with the same show or uh, the same uh, uh, leprapox virus is something that's called a Shop fibroma. But these are single, occasionally multiple uh, neoplasms of fibrocytes within the dermis. They're generally self-limiting in wild rabbits. Very rarely you may see visceral metastasis in very young rabbits, but they're because they are 
uh, composed of fibrocytes. They are extremely hard and you'll see the viral inclusions within these proliferating fibrocytes as well as the overlying epidermis, a very nice uh, ultrastructural picture of the intracytoplasmic uh, viral particles. Um, the, there's also viral protein. And a lot of times when we're dealing with RNA viruses and we see these really large, beautiful inclusions, they're often not viral particles. They're aggregates of viral proteins, either perhaps in some cases virus particles in assembly, um, but most often sort of junk proteins that the a viral incorporate viral genome causes a cell to make but often don't use and they will aggregate within the cytoplasm. So that is the Shope fibroma. Uh, in squirrels, and we're not talking about squirrels so I didn't put a picture in, but uh, infection with the same Lepora pox virus is going to cause something that looks very similar to uh, Shope fibromas. They're usually multiple. Um, they're called squirrel fibromas. Some people call them squirrel pox. And it's like having a lot more of these Shope fibromas. Uh, in outbreaks of myxomatosis, uh, people have used, to some effect, um, virus that they've taken from ground up, Shope fibromas, um, hoping that it was would offer some protection. And, and I'm not sure if it's all that effective, but uh, just realize that the two it's essentially the same virus. There obviously is some differences within the virus that would, it would act uh, in some uh, populations just to wipe them out and in others just to cause cutaneous lesions. Shope fibroma, myxomatosis, and uh, beautiful viral inclusions in the proliferating fibroblasts in the dermis and in the Shope fibroma, the overlying epidermis. Here's an interesting uh, uh, gross appearance that uh, some people might confuse with myxomatosis because of the tremendous swelling of the skin of the head. I don't think that the head's swollen because he's gripping it all that hard or she is gripping it all that hard. And this was a, uh, a condition that was first published in uh, 2008 in veterinary pathology. There's only been a couple of outbreaks. It's a, a disease in the Northwest, the first outbreak was uh, in Alaska and is seen mostly in meat or fur rabbits and it is due to herpes virus. The lesion is primarily that of a necrohemorrhagic dermatitis and paniculitis um, but these animals also have necrosis within the myocardium, pulmonary hemorrhage and uh, massive necrosis and fibrin deposition within the red pulp of the spring of the spleen. Here's another picture from that particular paper and you can see like a very classic herpes virus we have the formation of viral syncytia these were seen within the overlying epidermis and the hair follicular epithelium and you can see really beautiful herpes viral inclusions. There's only been a couple of outbreaks of this so and they're all in the US Northwest so I think it's worth certainly remembering, but probably not something you will uh, encounter all that commonly. Okay, now unfortunately we have to talk about syphilis. Syphilis in rabbits is not the same as syphilis in people. It's also called by, caused by a treponeme, treponema Paralewis cuniculi in the rabbits, but does not have the chronic uh, visceral disease that has been associated with syphilis in man. It also is transmitted venereally, although you can have transmission through extra genital contact by uh, one rabbit sniffing the, the bottom end, uh, or even the face of another infected rabbit. Because this organism is able to penetrate intact mucous membranes, it often will do that and set up a lymphoplasmacytic chronic crusting lesion within the mucosa of the genitals, less commonly of the, uh, the nares and the eyes as well. Susceptibility is often age and breed dependent, so more severe lesions will be seen in younger animals.
Here's a very typical crusty lesion of the vagina or the vulva in a rabbit. The hair is matted, it is sort of weepy, but it's a dry, non-ulcerative lesion at this particular point. Here's one where the scab has been removed, probably a younger rabbit who has contacted another, and uh, there's often a lot of sniffing going on um, uh, between strange rabbits. If there's not fighting going on, you never want to put two uh, bucks together. They will tend to fight each other. And because they don't have business cards, they sniff each other, and we get these sort of crusty lesions. Someone has pulled or ripped this scab off. Rarely are there any other extra cutaneous lesions in rabbits. Sometimes the, uh, the popliteal or the inguinal lymph nodes may be enlarged, but that is generally about it. It will also affect the mucous membranes around the eyes as well and is a rather old picture. But if you do a silver stain, like a Dieterlis, you will be able to pick up these fairly long treponemes within the inflamed skin. Look in the areas of inflammation, especially in more acute lesions, and you will find them. They're much longer than, than uh, uh, leptospires that we might see in the kidney. Okay, moving on to some other skin lesions, not traditionally a skin lesion, but this is a large staphylococcal abscess. You often will see these around the head and neck. You want to rule out pasturella. But staphylococcal dermatitis, especially in suckling kits, can be a real problem. And what you get is you get all these tiny, tiny, tiny little abscesses. These animals often will have internal abscesses and well in areas of necrosis in the liver and the spleen and multiple organs. This can be a big problem with young rabbits in meat or fur farms. So that's Staphylococcus. And Staph is a real problem because it can affect an animal in many different ways. It is ubiquitous in the environment, and we've seen it in the lungs, we've seen it in the heart in previous lectures. And another place that rabbits will get uh, staph infections is within the mammary gland. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the look of mammary gland, to me it looks very much like pancreas. There's two things in the body that uh, that look like pancreas, but if it has hair around it, it's probably not pancreas. It is mammary gland, and here in this mammary gland, we see a focal area of necrosis with hemorrhage. It is blanched and somewhat uh, discolored because this is staphylococcus. It's a type C coagulase positive staph aureus. These are the ones that generally have an exfoliative cytotoxin, a very powerful uh, exotoxin. The disease of mastitis is called blue breast in rabbits, not to be confused with blue bag, which can also be caused by Staph aureus. Um, it is a form of gangrenous mastitis in uh, small ruminants. Uh, all of the rabbits that this animal kindled that nurses on her will probably die. Obviously, she didn't do that well since we have her mammary gland on a tissue as well, but it is the major cause of mastitis in rabbits, Staph aureus. If you keep your bunnies on uh, wire cages, this is not the cage, this is the necropsy table. This is probably a big, fat, sedentary rabbit who was on straight wire somewhere above the ground, and it has uh, a condition known as ulcerative pododermatitis or sore hocks. And you'll see the exact same thing in rats that are uh, heavy, sedentary, and in somewhat unsanitary conditions because Staph aureus is always there. And you often, almost always, culture out uh, Staph aureus from these areas of sore hocks because the animals are down on their hocks in a dirty condition. They scrape them, they get pressure sores, and they're infected by Staph aureus. Okay, this is a very stinky ear, um, and it reminds me of cornflakes. It's diffuse hyperkeratotic uh, otodermatitis, or oral, A-U-R-A-L, dermatitis. It's a classic lesion 
that is associated with Seroptis cuniculi, the ear mite of rabbits. This parasite spends its entire life on the host. They are, they are non-burrowing mites. They are not difficult to find. You take some of this flake and you put it underneath the, uh, the microscope and you're going to see lots and lots of uh, adult nymph and eggs for this particular parasite. These animals are intensely paritic. There's a, a really bad inflammatory response to this and uh, they are often secondarily infected and the ears often smell to high heaven. There's a three-week life cycle for this parasite so it can uh, it can really quickly build up some really uh, significant numbers in affected ears, up to 10,000 mites in each ear. And the animals will traumatize them so they get secondary infections and it can be a real mess. Luckily, they do respond very well to ivermectin. And this is what the, uh, this is what the large female adults will look like. Sarcoptic mange. Uh, over 350 species of mammals have been identified with sarcoptic mange. Sarcoptic scabii. I do not believe that there is a, uh, a rabbit specific form like we see in some other mammals like pigs. And uh, it will also be very pruritic. Usually it's seen on the face, the ears, um, and the mucosa of the mouth and the external genitalia. There are actually two forms, I think, Scarcoptes scabii and Scarcoptes cuniculi, which are in the literature. I certainly couldn't tell the difference. Um, Peritic, but you don't get that tremendous f large cornflake-like lesion that you see inside the pinna. We're looking at the back of the pinna here. And another type of mite that you will see in rabbits, uh, which is referred to as uh, walking dandruff, not terribly severe, is Chyliotella. So they get a number of different mites as external parasites. If you are dealing with uh, wild rabbits, especially young wild rabbits, you may see a structure like this. Here's the head of the rabbit. It is sort of definitely not what some of you are thinking right now. These are actually maggots. Um, these are fly larva, the larva of Cuterebra masculator, which will lay its eggs in the open wounds of any type of mammal. And uh, young animals tend to be more effective. They're not as good as escaping the predator. And this one actually has two of them. They are large larva. And we're looking at the back end. They breathe through spiracles in their back end. And they have to have, they live within the subcutaneous tissue. They have their back end open so they can breathe through that. And this is what they look like. Um, if they're not surgically removed, then they will eventually uh, pop out. They will pupate on the ground and turn back into the cuterebra fly. Multifocal coalescing hyperkeratotic dermatitis uh, in rabbits, especially those kept outside, is often the result of ringworm infection or dermatomycosis. Usually in rabbits, it's trichophyte and menagrophytes. Uh, which is a geophilic uh, type of ringworm, primarily lives within the soil, but they do occasionally get infections with uh, microsporum canis, which they can get from dogs or cats. Most often seen on the face and the neck to start with, with a spread to the feet. It has a very typical histologic presentation that we see in dogs and cats, um, where you have inflammation which is centered on the follicles. Uh, dermatophytes only live in dead tissue, so they will live within the, the uh, uh, outer sheath of hair shafts where you can easily see the arthrospores, and the inflammation will uh, track those infected follicles, ultimately resulting in uh, folliculitis and occasionally fol folliculosis. Uh, it often uh, generates immunity, so infections are most commonly seen in young rabbits rather than older rabbits. Okay, this is a, a very scurfy disease with hair loss, which somewhat separates it from the mange that we've seen and dermatophytosis. This hair is 
epilating or coming out very easily. This is a rare condition in rabbits, which is an exfoliative dermatitis and sebaceous adenitis, which is seen in association with uh, or may not be with thymoma as a perineoplastic or may exist on its own. Sebaceous adenitis. It's not pruritic. It's not easily treated and histologically. You can see a follicular interface dermatitis and folliculitis, uh, obviously reduction in the sebaceous glands and long-standing cases dermal fibrosis, but make sure to check these animals for the presence of a concurrent thymoma. Here's a blind that's lost the tips of its ears, and we tend to think of uh, rabbits generally as very peaceful animals, but you put two males together and they are probably going to fight. Um, some, some bucks will become aggressive against both genders, and they have a very particular way of going after each other. If it's another male ferret they're fighting, they are going to try and get to the scrotum and castrate that animal. I don't know if it's planned or it is simply because the scrotum in many breeds of rabbits is poorly haired and makes for a pretty good target, especially as your opponent is running away. The other thing that they will go after are the ears. So be very careful in group housing rabbits, making sure that the animals are not going to exhibit conspecific aggression. Here's another one. This one isn't a, a fight wound, but uh, uh, for many years, People use the external ear veins, which are very prominent for the injection uh, of, of certain substances. It's one thing when you are taking blood out of the vein, but when you're putting a caustic substance in there, you have to be extremely careful. And if you get it out of the vein, obviously this is the kind of damage that you can do. So think about that when you have uh, necrosis of the ears in rabbits. And to finish up, uh, this particular set. Well, we're not even actually. I thought it was a little closer to the end, but uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of a rabbit disease um, from Dr. Tim Cooper. This is known as blue fur disease, and it's a moist dermatitis as a result of Pseudomonas aeruginosus infection. Pseudomonas aeruginosus, one of the uh, substances that will produce, which sort of um, gives it a edge over other bacteria because it is bactericidal as well as pigmented is pyocyanin and it's a blue discoloration uh, and one of the uh, one of the things that can happen with Pseudomonas aeruginosa in rabbits. Rarely you can see Pseudomonas aeruginosa in rabbits cause necrohemorrhagic pneumonia as it will do in some other mammalian species including mink and just another uh, picture showing you the blue discoloration and this sort of moist dermatitis that comes along. I would certainly consider the possibility of, uh, of slobbers here or malocclusion where you often get sort of greenish discoloration. This is a pretty unique little disease. We usually uh, finish up with tumors. And when you think about skin tumors in rabbits, um, the big one that they get are trichoblastomas. They're the most common cutaneous neoplasm of the rabbits. We see it all the time in, uh, in pet rabbits. They're hard nodules. They're easily shelled out. You often don't get the overlying skin because they pop out so nicely due to the very dense stroma that is studded by these cords and trabeculae of primitive follicular epithelium. Another tumor of the rabbit is caused by not the Shope fibromavirus, which we've already talked about, but the Shope papillomavirus. Dr. Shope was an NIH researcher, did a lot of work with viral diseases in laboratory species. So he has his name on a number of them. He has a, a pox virus. He has a papillomavirus named after him. And uh, like most papillomaviruses, you can see that um, you can have the presence of cutaneous horns associated with the tremendous proliferation of the epithelium in infected rabbits, which has given rise to the myth of the jackalope. So if you are a, 
looking for a jackalope in the western United States, you may find one, but it's going to be the result of papillomavirus infection. In cottontail rabbits, it usually causes uh, these papillomas and maybe cutaneous horns, but when it's injected into rictilagus, you have a much higher rate of malignant transformation of papillomas into squamous cell carcinomas, which don't produce any infectious virus. Remember that uh, there's a tremendous emerging body of evidence in the last decade which links papillomavirus with uh, squamous cell carcinomas, and a number of species and rabbits are no different. Um, they can in the cottontail rabbit either regress or progress onto carcinoma. And in, when injected into laboratory rabbits, they're a model for viral induced malignancy as well as hypercalcemia of malignancy. So it does a whole lot of very interesting things for a papillomavirus. a recent publication within the last uh, seven or eight years uh, looking at skin lymphoma in pet rabbits showed that it is a very common uh, finding in rabbits and the vast majority, the majority of these are uh, T-cell rich B-cell lymphomas. Hutchburn well, usually associated with unsanitary conditions, and this is just urine, fecal, scald, and, and rabbit cages, like guinea pig cages, need to be changed on a very, very regular basis, and this is, there's no excuse for something like this. Also, you can have animals which will rub the fur off its face trying to get to an ill-placed feeder or waterer, or sometimes they'll do this just from boredom or it feels good. So there's just a little bunny with the hair rubbed off its face and we have actually looked at this particular one I didn't know why I just threw this one in I didn't know I already had it so this is our friend with uh, pyocyanin pigmentation again and that brings us to the end of the diseases of the integumentary system of rabbits I hope you learned something and I hope you will feel that this is 30 minutes well spent and come back to the uh, Foundation's YouTube channel or Facebook page to see the next lecture on, uh, on rabbits, which will include the musculoskeletal system. And we'll throw in a little bit more, maybe, uh, uh, maybe the urinary system as well. Hey, thanks for stopping by. Really appreciate it. Have a great day.